Welcome back to the Manly Saints Project. I'm me, Hugh Hunter. We live in a world that struggles to understand the virtues of manliness. Our culture doesn't provide young men, or any men for that matter, with a lot of positive male role models. When I became a Catholic, I wanted to show how the saints could be manly role models for us. My weekly exploration of manly saints became the Manly Saints Project. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the links in the show notes to buy me a beer. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today as we encounter a saint who walked among the Druids to claim their role in the name of Christ. Name, Kieran, with multiple spellings. Feast, September 9th. Life, approximately 515 to 550 AD. Status, Saint. The monastery of Clonmacnoise in Ireland operated for a thousand years until it was finally shut down by Henry VIII. It had not been a smooth millennium. Over the centuries, the monastery had been raided by Vikings, Normans, and by their fellow Irish countrymen on more than 30 occasions. The monastery had been burned down 13 times. It had all gone just as St. Kieran predicted. The truth was that Clonmacnoise was a magnet for raiders for the same reason it was a good monastery. It was placed right at the center of things. Clonmacnoise bordered the provinces of Connaught, Munster, and Leinster, and sat on a river as well as a major road. It was right at the center of Ireland. Kieran's strange, short life had been leading him to this place. Our story begins before Kieran was born. Kieran's father, Beoid, was a woodworker, a builder of war chariots for the would-be heroes of Ireland, and carts for ordinary people. Perhaps Beoid married up, for his wife, Derirka, came from a line of druids. In another time, Beoit and Dererka's children might have embarked on the training that would make them bards, seers, or, after twenty years, full druids. But Beoit and Dererka were followers of the new faith that had come over to Ireland, Christianity. All five of their boys ended up in the church, most becoming priests like Kieran, although Cronin, the baby, only made it to the rank of deacon. But from the start, there was something different about Kieran. One day, when Kieran's mother Dererka was pregnant with him, she was riding in a cart past the house of a druid. The druid's head snapped up. A great man is passing by, he told his students. They ran out and looked, and came in laughing, saying that it was only the cartwright's wife. The druid smiled. The boy she carries, he said, will shine through this land like the sun. The fact that this story made it into the various lives of St. Kieran tells us something about the relationship between the Druids and the early Christians. Kieran would be born not too long after St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. In one way, because they were religious leaders, the Druids were in competition with the Church. But Irish Christians recognized that in Ireland, the Druids played a social role as well. That role would be difficult to fill. Among the Romans, for example, being a priest was a part-time job. Being a druid, on the other hand, was a lifelong commitment. Becoming a druid meant studying for 20 years, moving through the lower ranks of bards and seers, until you finally emerged at the top of the social structure. Druids weren't warriors, although they were feared, and they weren't kings, although they were obeyed. The peoples of the north still kept the Indo-European division of men into four classes, the ones who worked, the ones who created, the ones who fought, and above all, the priestly class. Diodorus Siculus, writing several centuries earlier, tried to explain the phenomenon to his southern readers. These druids and bards are observed and obeyed, not only in times of peace, but war also both by friends and enemies. 
Many times these philosophers and poets stepping in between two near at hand when they are just ready to engage with their swords drawn and spears presented one against another have pacified them as if some wild beasts had been tamed by enchantments. Time's rage is mastered by wisdom even among the most savage barbarians. For the early Christians of Ireland, it was a given that the teachings of the Druids needed to be corrected. The prayers of the saints averted Druidic magic, or perhaps exposed its tricks. But it was not a given that the social role of Druid needed to be eliminated. Irish Christians sometimes employed the metaphors and imagery of Druids, putting things in ways that would be familiar to their audience, as missionaries often do. And few of the saints fell so clearly into this pattern as did Kieran, on his journey to the center of Ireland. It was not a journey that Kieran had planned, so let us start where he started. Kieran was a precocious child, or so the story suggests, but not even he could become a wise man overnight. So he set out to find a teacher to learn wisdom, as the tale of his life in the Book of Lismore has it. Kieran's schooling began when he joined the abbey of another future saint, Finian, in Clonard, in what is today Northern Ireland. The wisdom that Kieran learned from Finian was the monastic tradition, which had been developed by the Desert Fathers and then spread throughout the Christian world. There, Kieran's legendary generosity would begin to manifest, as he gave his possessions cheerfully to those in need trusting God to provide. This included his Bible, a rare possession in those days, which he gave to another student who had the unfortunate name Ninid the Squinting. It was also as a student that Kieran met Colum Killa, a young monk like himself. Colum Killa was a prince, and everyone thought he could have been king. He had left all that behind to seek God. Kieran grew strong and handsome. Some of the tales surrounding him have lovesick girls who were interested in Kieran and whom he gently deflected. Several of them discovered, to their own surprise, a monastic vocation. A poet told one such story. A maid, rich in stateliness, with Kieran there was reading. Of her form or shapeliness, he was all unheeding. Finian, the abbot, watched the development of Kieran and Columkilla and wondered what their futures held. And then, one night, he had a dream. In the dream, Ireland had not one moon, but two, each shining gold with reflected light. One of the moons moved into the center of the island, while the other one went north and east to the island of Iona. And Finian knew that these two moons were his students. Columkilla, or Columba, as he would come to be known, would found the monastery at Iona. But Kieran would move to the very center of the island of Ireland to confront paganism at its strongest, far from the more sophisticated cities of the coast. The message had been spelled out in the language of astronomy, or astrology, an important part of druidry. But Kieran's role wasn't to watch the moon and stars. It was to direct God's light himself. Finian began to encourage Kieran to undertake this task. Kieran, though, took a roundabout route. In time, he crossed almost to the other side of the island to meet another great future saint of his time. Enda, a warrior who had become a monk, but who had used his knowledge of siegecraft to fortify his monastery, just in case. Kieran and Enda together had the experience of a shared vision. In the vision, Kieran's destiny was spelled out again. Kieran and Enda saw a colossal and flourishing tree, rooted in the center of Ireland, on the bank of a river. The tree was laden with good fruit, 
and its branches were filled with birds. Now in the old tales of Irish paganism, the hero who slipped over the border into the other world would often encounter this tree. The story of St. Brendan Christianizes that hero's quest, and he too discovers the tree of birds. But Kieran's path wasn't that of the warrior. The tree, Enda explained, was Kieran. Kieran had traveled across Ireland, and each of Ireland's great Christian teachers had given him the same message. It was time to begin his search for the center of the island. Every once in a while, Kieran thought he had come to the spot in the center of Ireland where he was meant to be. He'd settle for a while, and then something would prompt him on his way. En route, Kieran met kings and beggars. He gave what he had away, sometimes angering the kings who thought they had honored him with lavish gifts when Kieran handed their gifts off to the first beggar who asked for them. One king that Kieran angered in this way had the holy man captured and enslaved. The king put Kieran to work, so the story goes, turning a huge stone wheel to grind grain. But when the king came to see how his punishment was going, Kieran was in prayer and the wheel was turning on its own. This sort of thing was exactly why even kings did not dare to confront druids, and the king hastily sent Kieran on his way. Kings feared druids because of their power, and the various lives of Kieran include examples where immediate misfortune befalls those who lie to or disrespect him. But Kieran's story offers a Christian perspective on the figure of the druid here as well, for Kieran prays for those who hurt him and heals them with prayer whenever he gets the chance. But I think that my favorite Kieran story is the one about his pet fox. Kieran had trained it to deliver a prayer book to another monk. In this way, the book could be shared between them. But on one occasion, perhaps as the fox was about to return the prayer book to Kieran, natural treacherousness broke forth in the fox, and the fox began to chew on the prayer book. In the story, the local king happened to be there. The king decided to impress the holy man by hunting down the fox that had mauled the book. So he whistled for his hounds and set off in pursuit. The fox ran all the way back to Kieran, hiding under his cloak. The king arrived to catch it, and then stopped. I like to imagine the king's jaw dropping while he gawped at Kieran as the structure of the parable he had just enacted fell into place in his mind. Isn't it true that when we are most at ease, our natural treacherousness bubbles up in sin? And then, when sickness or misfortune or anything else reminds us that we are deserving of punishment, what do we do? We run back to take refuge in the cloak of Christ, the very one we have most wronged by sinning. Now that he saw the fox as a symbol of his own nature, taking vengeance on the little animal seemed like an unwise precedent to set, and the king called his hounds and went home. Finally, after many encounters, Lessons taught, miracles performed, slaves freed, hungry people fed. Kieran's way brought him to Clonmacnoise. This was the place. Kieran began to build. As he was building the monastery that would be his legacy, a druid was passing by. Kieran was about to set the corner post, but the druid told him to stop. It was an unlucky time for beginnings, the druid said. Kieran was happy for the chance to reject the druid's advice. Against thy sign I fix this post in the ground, for I care not for the art of wizards, but in the name of my Lord, Jesus Christ, do I all my works. As the monastery continued to be built, a warrior came to help. He must have spoken to Kieran of his ambitions, for Kieran took on another role of the druid, that of a chooser of kings. Everyone knew that no king could stand if the druid disagreed with the choice. Now it was Kieran, the priest, who would choose the next high king. 
As they fitted a post in place, Kieran put his hand on top, leading the work. The warrior understood the symbolism. Warrior, suffer my hand to be over thy hand, and thou shalt be over the men of Ireland in high kingship. The future high king followed Kieran's lead. He helped with the construction, knowing he would be a Christian king. It was Kieran's destiny to wander through Ireland, reclaiming the ways of the Druids, until he raised the monastery at Clonmacnoise. But it was not his destiny to live there for long. He remained there as abbot long enough to create a monastic rule. Then a plague swept Ireland, and Kieran got sick. As he was dying, Kieran had a vision of what would happen to the monastery he had set up. He saw raids and violence and conflict. It filled him with sorrow. And I'm sure his fears were not allayed when he told his monks, and they asked him exactly the wrong question. Should they stay and guard the relics he would leave behind? I imagine Kieran, sick and weak, wondering if he had the strength to bang his head on the wall. When the raiders came, Kieran said, leave my relics as the bones of a deer are left in the sun. For it is better for you to live with me in heaven than to stay here with my relics. For most of his life, Kieran had been a spiritual guide to others. He had taken on the druids, not only rebuking their teachings, but stepping into their role. He had built a monastery that would last a thousand years. He had done all this by his early thirties. And if this seems too much for a man, perhaps it's right that at the end of his life, we finally meet Kieran at his most human. He looked up at the sky and thought about his death. Awful is this road upward. Not for thee is it awful, said the monks. Kieran shook his head. Truly, I know not any of the commandments of God which I have transgressed. Yet even David, son of Jesse, and Paul, the apostle, dreaded this way. And so, Kieran turned, as he had his whole life, to the encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. Propped up a little on a rock that was placed behind him, the man who had lived as a druid for God received the viaticum. And then, I'll leave it to the author of the Book of Lismore to finish the story. Then, angels filled the space between heaven and earth to receive his soul.